In New York, drivers don't forget a machine that makes you tense up for an entire shift. Not the ones that fight the wheel, punish your spine, and turn every pothole into a question mark. And this isn't a story about some worn-out old bus limping along at the end of its life. The Grumman 870 became a problem when it was still supposed to be the future, new, modern, and ready for the toughest streets in America. So here's the two-part question that still hangs in the air. Why did New York drivers hate this bus so much they never forgave it? And just as chilling, why was it pulled off the streets, then stored away like evidence? Because behind the rumors is a real chain of cause and effect. We're going to strip it down to three things. The core engineering failures, the safety breaking point, and the true cost in money and reputation. By the late 1970s, American transit agencies were under real pressure. Fleets were aging fast, maintenance costs were climbing, and everyone was looking for a bus that felt new, lighter, more modern, easier to standardize across a big system. On paper, the answers seemed obvious. Replace the old workhorses, modernize, save money over the long haul. And on paper, the Grumman 870 checked the right boxes. This wasn't some fringe experiment or limited pilot program. It was ordered to do real work at real scale in the toughest environment imaginable. The brochures promised progress. New York expected performance. That expectation was backed by serious commitment. Between 1980 and 1982, the New York City Transit Authority purchased 851 Grumman 870s, spending $92.2 million in public money. That kind of number doesn't signal a gamble, it signals confidence. This bus was meant to become a backbone of the system. But here's the problem with brochures. They tell one story. New York streets tell another. New York City doesn't test a bus. It grinds it down. Day after day, mile after mile, the streets deliver a punishment no proving ground can truly simulate. Stop-and-go traffic builds heat into every system. Engine, suspension, brakes, while constant vibration works metal until fatigue sets in. Loads are heavy, schedules are tight, and nothing ever gets a chance to cool off. Then there's the pavement itself. Potholes, patched asphalt, uneven joints, and constant curb strikes hammer the structure and suspension over and over again. What looks fine on smooth roads starts to loosen, shift, and complain when it's forced to absorb that kind of abuse. Add long driver shifts and near-continuous service and you get a machine that's almost never resting. That's why New York is different. In some cities, a flaw is an inconvenience, a nuisance that slows things down. In New York, a flaw becomes a risk. When something doesn't feel right, it doesn't stay a minor annoyance for long. New York drivers don't ask for perfection, they ask for trust. A bus can be uncomfortable, loud, even stubborn, but the moment it feels like it might betray the person behind the wheel, its fate is sealed. This is where the Grumman 870 truly lost New York. Not because of cosmetics, not because of comfort, but because of problems buried deep in the structure. Structurally related failures that attack the very bones of the bus. Once that happens, trust doesn't erode slowly. It collapses. Think of it as a map of stress points each one telling part of the same story. A-frame cracking sat at the center of it. That component lives where stability and steering feel intersect, so when it begins to crack, drivers feel it immediately. The bus doesn't track the same way. It doesn't settle the same way. It starts to feel nervous, vague, and wrong. Then there was engine cradle cracking, a problem tied directly to weight and vibration. The engine is one of the heaviest, most dynamic loads on the vehicle. When the structure supporting it begins to fatigue, everything downstream suffers. Vibrations change, resonances build, small issues start cascading into bigger ones, 
add trunnion bracket failures, and now the suspension's relationship to the frame itself is compromised. That's when alignment drifts, tires wear unevenly, and the ride grows harsher by the week. Not overnight, gradually, quietly. And that's what made it so dangerous. Drivers didn't describe one sudden failure. They described a bus that felt different after a few months, then different again. The steering wheel no longer told the same story it did before. The bus reacted a fraction of a second later than expected. It leaned, shook, or wandered just enough to make you tighten your grip. This is how structural fatigue shows itself in the real world. As metal works and geometry shifts, the vehicle slowly changes character. And a bus that changes character is a bus you can't predict. In New York, that's unforgivable. Cosmetic flaws can be tolerated. Even mechanical annoyances can be managed. But when the structure itself begins to lie to the driver, when the bus no longer behaves the way it did last month, the relationship is over. Because structural failures don't just break parts, they break confidence. If the structural cracks undermined confidence, the steering finished it off. Among the reported issues on the Grumman 870 were steering column failures, and for a New York driver, that's a line you never want to cross. Steering isn't just a system, it's the conversation between the driver and the bus. When that conversation breaks down, fear moves in fast. Drivers began to describe a wheel that no longer felt honest. The feedback wasn't consistent. You'd turn in, wait a beat, then feel the bus respond in a way that didn't quite match your hands. To compensate, drivers tensed up, shoulders tight, grip firm, body braced for the next surprise. Over a long shift, that kind of tension becomes exhausting. Fatigue sets in and with it, tiny delays in reaction time. A half second here, a small correction there. In New York traffic, those margins matter. The harder you have to work just to keep the bus where it belongs, the more the risk quietly climbs. You can live with an uncomfortable seat. You can tolerate noise, heat, even a stubborn transmission. But you cannot live with a bus that makes you guess what it's going to do when the next pothole or curb strike comes up. That's the truth many New York drivers understood. A bus doesn't have to cause a spectacular crash to be hated. If it makes you afraid, day after day, mile after mile, that's already enough. As the complaints piled up, the Grumman 870 picked up something even more damaging than a bad reputation. It picked up the scent of danger. Reports began to surface of power cables chafing, insulation worn through by vibration and movement, turning routine operation into an electrical gamble. At first, that kind of issue sounds like a nuisance, something maintenance can stay ahead of. Then came the word no transit system ever wants attached to its fleet. Fires. Wheel well fires don't need much explanation. The phrase alone is enough to tighten a driver's stomach, especially in a city where a stopped bus can mean chaos in seconds. Add fuel line rusting to the picture, and the tone changes completely. Rusted fuel lines are not an inconvenience. They are a risk, plain and simple. This is how the narrative shifted. Electrical wear becomes heat. Heat becomes ignition. Ignition in a crowded city becomes unacceptable. In New York, rumors of buses that catch fire or suffer electrical failures spread fast. And once that story takes hold, a bus doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. Its reputation is finished. Every troubled vehicle has a moment when complaints turn into decisions. For the Grumman 870 in New York, that moment came when concern hardened into something far more serious. Safety. Among all the transit systems operating the 870, the New York City Transit Authority stood alone. NYCTA was the only system to report permanently pulling the buses from service due to safety concerns. That distinction matters. This wasn't a temporary sidelining or a cautious pause. It was a line drawn in ink. And what happened next says everything about how deep the mistrust ran. The withdrawn 870s weren't quietly retired or scattered to secondary duties. They were stored in a fenced lot under 24-hour security at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Guarded. Isolated. Treated less like surplus equipment and more like evidence. That image is impossible to ignore. This wasn't out of service in the usual sense. 
It wasn't a bus waiting for parts or a future rebuild. It was a statement. Do not trust this machine. In a city that runs on momentum, pulling hundreds of buses off the street is an extraordinary move. It disrupts schedules, strains spare ratios, and sends shockwaves through operations. You don't do it lightly. You do it when the risk of keeping them in service outweighs every other consequence. This was the moment the Grumman 870's fate was sealed in New York. Not by rumor, not by reputation alone, but by a decision so definitive it left a physical mark on the city itself. This is where New York drivers never forgave stops being a phrase and becomes a documented act. When the Grumman 870 came off the street, the real cost began to surface. A bus sitting in a yard isn't just a broken machine, it's a missing piece in the daily puzzle. Fewer buses on the line meant shuffled assignments, tighter spare ratios, and more pressure on drivers and maintenance crews already stretched thin. Every sidelined 870 forced the system to work harder just to stay even. Then came the money burn. Inspections, repairs, retrofit campaigns, each one consumed time and budget, often without restoring confidence. These weren't routine fixes. They were attempts to correct deep structural problems, and they added up fast. All of this landed against a harsh backdrop. $92.2 million already spent to buy the fleet in the first place. When that kind of public investment has to be withdrawn for safety reasons, backlash is inevitable. Political, public, and internal. Industry analysis later made the picture even darker, noting massive losses at Grumman Flexible tied largely to the cost of repairing cracked bus understructures. That's the real disaster here. Not just broken buses, but broken trust, along with lost money and lost operational capacity. Here's the twist that keeps the Grumman 870 story from being simple. According to government review, many other transit systems reported being generally satisfied with the 870. The same bus that became untouchable in New York continued to run elsewhere. That fact alone forces a deeper question. The answer lives in context. First, operating conditions. Much of the country ran these buses on lighter suburban routes, smoother pavement, and less punishing duty cycles. What survived there was pushed to its limits in New York. Second, risk tolerance. In some systems, an uneasy feeling could be managed. In New York, it couldn't. When a bus feels unpredictable, that sensation alone is disqualifying. There's no margin for probably fine in a city this dense. And finally, driver culture. New York drivers talk. Stories travel fast from depot to depot, shift to shift. Once a machine earns a bad name, it carries it forever. That's the lesson the Grumman 870 leaves behind. A design that doesn't win on real streets doesn't win at all. And in New York, drivers don't forget.